Hello everybody and welcome to Telescope Talk Pro, a weekly hangout dedicated to discussing the latest discoveries, science, equipment, and observatories in the world of professional ground-based astronomy. My name is Tony Darnell from deepastronomy.space and today's hangout is one of the is one I've been waiting for for a long time. We are going to learn about the Event Horizon Telescope, a worldwide collaboration that is connecting observatories from all over the planet to create one Earth-sized telescope that is designed to do one thing, to directly image the event horizon of a black hole. I know, <laughs> that's right, directly image a black hole. That specifically the supermassive one at the center of the Milky Way called Sagittarius A-star. Now, today's guest is Jeff Bauer. He is one of the founding members of the Event Horizon Telescope. He's also a chief science, scientist for Hawaii operations at his institute, uh, and he will tell us all about this amazing project. But before I start, I need to mention that the Telescope Talk Hangouts are sponsored by OPT Telescopes, a world leader in telescopes and accessories for both amateur and professional astronomers. If you need a telescope, or if you have a question, or if you need an eyepiece about just about anything, or you just want to talk about telescopes and astronomy with somebody who, who is just as passionate as you are about the night sky, then reach out to them at the link in the description box below and uh, tell them Tony sent you. <laughs> so my, my co-host for Telescope Talk Pro is Christian Reddy from Launchpad Astronomy, a collaborating YouTube channel that we are also streaming this hangout to. So welcome, Christian, and let me bring you up as soon as I can find my cursor. There it is. Hi, Christian. How you doing? Oh, yes. I see you're in the in the spirit. <laughs> we can't hear you. We can't hear you, Chris. Are you are you muted? Welcome back to Launchpad Astronomy. I'm Christian Reddy, your friendly neighborhood <laughs> astronomer, and you are live on Telescope Talk Pro, where we take astronomy seriously. Very seriously. So, um, that's right. <laughs> How exciting is this? We get to we are now embarking on an opportunity. Well, rather rather to kind of back it up a little bit, uh, just for my viewers. We have talked at great length about black holes on this channel, and we talk about black holes all the time in physics and astronomy. And it's great to talk about black holes. We've seen tremendous evidence for black holes. We've never actually seen a black hole, and that's for good reason. Because black holes are by definition black. They swallow all the light that falls into it. So how does one actually see a black hole? And the short answer is you don't, but you see what is immediately surrounding or rather see the shadow of the black hole. And for the first time ever, astronomers are in the process of doing just that, taking an image, as Tony said, of the event horizon of a black hole. So I'm super excited to welcome our guest, Dr. Jeffrey Bauer, a project scientist for the Event Horizon Telescope. And uh, welcome aboard, Jeffrey. It's great to have you. Uh, it's terrific to be here. Thanks so much for the invitation. Uh, I'm really excited to talk about our project. Well, that was my dog. Uh, that was your <laughs> dog. Just, someone just showed up. Guest. Not my dog. Yeah. Oh, Tony's dog. <laughs> yes. One day in these hangouts, I'm going to have a panther cam. That's the name of my dog, Panther. <laughs> so anyway. All right, Jeffrey. All right. So, um, so you work in Hawaii, but you're a member of the, uh, you're a member of the Event Horizon Telescope collaboration. Can you describe a little bit about what the what do you? I mean, I mentioned it in broad terms, but maybe you could talk a little bit about what exactly you're planning, what the goal, science-wise, of the Event Horizon Telescope is supposed to be. Sure. So, as you said, the Event Horizon Telescope is a uh, global collaboration that uh, makes use of telescopes around the world, and. Uh, our goal is to make the very first image uh, of a black hole uh, and have the most definitive proof yet for the existence of black holes. Uh, and so we're using a, a, a technique called radio interferometry that uh, uh, we use to combine together these telescopes around the world uh, and do something that no one has ever done before. So when we talk about imaging, I mean, like Christian said, black holes are black. Uh, so we are, is the goal here, when you say the event horizon, are you looking for like a real delineated uh, boundary between things we can see and things we can't see? And will we see the entire thing or just a portion of it? What's the, what's the expectation? So, Help us so, visualize what we'll see. Yeah, so we're not going to see the black hole. 
and I, I, we 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 should we should be precise in how we talk about this. What we're going to see is the light that's emitted from just right around the black hole. We're going to be closer in than anyone else has ever gotten by about a factor of a thousand in terms of imaging the the effects uh, of a black hole. And what we're what we're going to see is the 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 light from the very hot particles that are falling onto the black hole, maybe being ejected out of the black hole. Uh, and they are, these particles are super hot uh, because they've accumulated all that gravitational potential energy as they fall down onto the black hole. And, uh, and so they radiate very efficiently, producing lots of, lots of light, uh, lots of radio waves. And what we, what we expect to see is the effects of strong gravitational lensing uh, caused by the black hole because we're in this weird domain of the, uh, uh, of the black hole's gravity uh, in uh, very close proximity, so the strong gravity of the black hole. Now you have you so, sent me several vi uh, uh, visuals. Um, sh would, would would you like me to show that uh, that MP4 the video or was yeah, it yeah yeah let's okay. let's show that right now. Uh, go ahead and cue that up and play that. Okay, it's playing right now. Um, so that <clears throat> this image is uh, this is a theoretical image of what we expect to see. Uh, so you're this is a movie. Uh, and uh, it's meant to convey uh, how the source might change uh, over, how the black hole and its environment, environment might change over the course of a few hours. And so that ring that you're seeing, uh, that is what we call the, the uh, or we say we're seeing the shadow uh, of the black hole cast upon uh, the, the light that's uh, that's emitted from right around the black hole, and so that ring that you're seeing there, the well-defined one up front, the, the, right? The well-defined one is very strong prediction uh, of uh, of general relativity that that ring should be present there. That all the light is getting focused into into that ring. We call it the photon ring. It's where where the light is uh, is is uh, is escaping from the black hole's environment to us and being focused towards us. Um, and that, uh, the other, well, and that ring, the really amazing thing about that ring is that it's actually very simply defined by the black hole. It has a diameter that's just about, uh, five times, uh, the, uh, diameter or the, the radi the Schwarzschild radius. And, uh, uh, so the Schwarzschild radius is just the, uh, the, uh, 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 basically, the size of the event horizon, the, the region beyond which uh, all uh, light cannot escape. And so that ring is very well defined. It's predicted by general relativity. So our very first goal is we want to see that ring when we look at, uh, uh, at the black hole in the center of our galaxy uh, and at other black holes uh, in the centers of other galaxies. And you said this was the photon ring? Uh, yeah, that's right. So it's the region just, well, it's just outside the photon ring. So the photon ring is where, uh, where light, uh, uh, the boundary at which light can't escape. But uh, just outside that is the ring where, where light can escape to us uh, uh, from, uh, from the black hole's environment. So light can approach this ring. And if it goes just a smidgen past it, it's trapped. But right, is right. It, are these photons in orbit, or are they just being gravitationally lensed in this picture? Well, so some of these photons will will actually have been in orbit uh, around the around the black hole, right? So we're we're in this regime where space time is bent, uh, and uh, uh, and so some photons will go around and around and around the black hole. Uh, before they finally escape and uh, and come to us, uh, and some will be on a, a more a more direct path where their where their uh, where their trajectory is just bent uh, uh, by the by the light, but they don't make a uh, a complete revolution around the black hole. 
and the asymmetries in that we're seeing is this is this based on material falling in or why are there why is it bright on one side and not so bright on the other yeah that's a great question so the brightness the the enhanced brightness on one side that you see relative to the other side is a is a prediction of special relativity uh, and it's uh, it's basically the uh, it's what we call Doppler boosting. So that that material we think as it falls in, it forms into uh, a rotating accretion disk or a flow that goes around the black hole as it's going in. And the speed of that gas as it's falling in is ac approaching the speed of light. And just as the, the, the ordinary Doppler effect works where, you know, you, you, get, you get a higher frequency signal that comes to you when, when something's approaching you. Um, we get more intense light uh, in, the part of the, in the part of the accretion flow that's, that's coming towards us as opposed to the part that's going away from us. But so this is not then an accretion disk? Well, it's one of the remarkable things is that uh, there is we we think that an accretion disk must form, but one of the remarkable things is that what we expect to see is actually not that dependent on exactly how the gas is structured around the black hole. There might be a thin accretion disk. There might be a kind of quasi spherical accretion flow where gas is coming in from all directions. And there might also be a relativistic jet that's present there. And as long as this emission is being created really close to the black hole, within a few to maybe 10 times the Schwarzschild radius, then we're going to get this ring. Okay. So this is what we expect to see. Now, can you remind me again the wavelengths that we're going to be looking at? You said it at the top. Right. So this is radio astronomy, millimeter wavelength radio astronomy. So... Mm -hmm. Um, we're right now, the experience experiments we're doing are at a, a wavelength of, uh, one millimeter. So I can't really do that with my fingers, but I can, I can get close. Uh, so that's, uh, uh, it's light with a, a, a frequency of 230 gigahertz or a wavelength of, a, a of about one millimeter. And um, the so just to, just to, oh, I'm sorry, go ahead. Continue, Jeff. Uh, well, I was going to say there, well, uh, there are a couple reasons that we want to work at uh, at this wavelength, and yeah. and one is that the um, these uh, our black holes uh, tend to be very bright uh, at uh, uh, at these wavelengths. The other is that uh, the the uh, the technique that we're using interferometry we get we get more and more precise measurements the shorter the wavelength, hmm. uh, and. Uh, We'd love to do this experiment uh, in the in the optical or the X-ray, where the the wavelengths are very very short. Uh, but technologically, that's that's not possible right now. Um, so, so this is a combination of what's possible. For, like you're you're basically trying to do the best with what we what the current state of the art allows us to, allows us to do. Exactly, we're on the we're on the bleeding edge of the uh, of interferometry technology to to go all the way to one millimeter wavelengths. And uh, do you think you could tell us a little about what it means to do interferometry? Uh, I, I think uh, one thing I always try to tell my students is that yeah, we can do a lot with radio telescopes, but because the radio waves are so physically long, mm -hmm. as you point out, it's very difficult to get very high resolution images that way. So how do you do that? How do you how do you produce the kind of resolution you need at radio wavelengths? Sure. So you're you're exactly right. That a, well, uh, so a basic fact that I, I'm sure you've taught your students, Christian, is that uh, um, you know the the shorter the wavelength, the uh, the higher the resolution, and the larger the diameter of your telescope, the higher the angular resolution, and. Uh, uh, so in the optical, you uh, you build a you build a bigger uh, a bigger mirror and you get a higher angular resolution. And the same thing is true at radio wavelengths. We we build a, a bigger antenna and we get more angular resolution. Uh, but because the uh, because the wavelengths are so large, uh, uh, even a millimeter is is, uh, is a very large wavelength for light. Um, 
we physically can't build our telescopes as big as we need them to be in order to uh, in order to be able to get the resolution that we want. Um, for your technically minded uh, uh, listeners, we're trying to we're we're getting a, an angular resolution uh, of of about twenty micro arc seconds, uh, and uh, uh, so. A typical seeing with a ground-based optical telescope might be one arc second. So this is 50,000 times more precise uh, than that. And that's, a comb- and that's due to a combination of both the wavelength that you're using and the diameter of the telescope. Exactly, okay. exactly. So, um, so we'd like to, to, in order to get that angular resolution at the wavelength where we're working, we need a telescope that is the diameter of the Earth. We need an 8,000 kilometer telescope. Uh, now, I would love it if our funding agencies would just give us the money to go and build a giant telescope that would shadow half the planet. Uh, <laughs> uh, but, uh, but that's not really practical. So... Well, go ahead. Well, I was just going to say what we did do, though, is you've put together several telescopes uh, throughout the planet and you've tied them together, right? That's what the Event Horizon Telescope does. That's exactly right. So the Event Horizon Telescope ties together telescopes that already exist uh, uh, in some of the best observing locations around the world. uh, And we tie them together and the... um, the, the separation between the most distant pair of, of telescopes is what sets our angular resolution. And I'm uh, showing the, I'm just so you know, uh, I'm showing the graphic uh, called EHT array uh, right, uh, okay, right now great. as you're talking. So, yeah. So, uh, so this, uh, this graphic shows our network of, uh, of telescopes. Uh, and uh, let me pull it up just to, Make sure I'm talking about exactly the the same thing you are, right? So, um, the uh, you can see uh, our global network here in uh, in this uh, in this image. We have telescopes uh, where I'm located in Hawaii. We have two telescopes on the mountain of Mauna Kea: the submillimeter array and the James Clerk Maxwell Telescope. Um, we have a telescope on Mount Graham in Arizona: the submillimeter telescope. There's the Large Millimeter Telescope in Mexico, the Greenland Telescope in Greenland, uh, two telescopes in Chile, the ALMA Telescope and APEX, and there's the South Pole Telescope, and we also have two facilities in Europe that are contributing, one that's shown here in Spain and another uh, in France that will be joining us uh, next year uh, in our experiment. So effectively, this is a this is an effect. This is a telescope with an effective aperture or diameter, the size of the planet. Correct. Uh, that's right. So effective diameter, the size of the planet, but uh, effective area, uh, much much smaller. Uh, right? right. So it's basically a mirror uh, that's almost totally missing. You can think of it as just a mirror, but where we only have the pieces of, of the mirror that uh, where the individual telescopes uh, are located. And so even though that's a really flawed mirror, uh, we're, able to, uh, <laughs> we're able to work some algorithmic magic uh, <laughs> and, uh, 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 and actually construct an image from this, from this data. And let's talk a little bit about how they're connected then. So this is a, while it's physically large in diameter, it's not a complete mirror. It's got holes all over it because the only resolving elements are the bits where the, where the, the apexes of these lines come together. Uh, and so, but every one of these telescopes is looking in the millimeter range. These are radio telescopes, like you said. And one of the most important ones, as I understood, as I've been reading about this, has been ALMA. ALMA is the Atacama Large Millimeter Submillimeter Array in Chile. It is one of the most oversubscribed telescopes in the planet, but it's a very high-resolution radio telescope. So does that mean that even though the mirror is mostly missing, like you point out, the but some of the elements are really doing a good job getting some good data, right? 
Yeah, absolutely. So the introduction of Alma into our uh, project uh, has has really transformed what we're able to do. So your viewers can can uh, see the picture of, of Alma that's beneath the globes here. Uh, and uh, it doesn't fully convey uh, just how massive uh, Alma is. Alma consists of 50 uh, individual telescopes, 12 meters in diameter, about 40 feet in, uh, in diameter. Uh, and uh, many of our individual stations uh, only consist of a single antenna that is smaller than one of, one of those antennas. So we have a massive amount of collecting uh, uh, power uh, there at, uh, at the Alma site. Uh, and, uh, that gives us incredible sensitivity, uh, for our, for our network and has really changed the game for us in terms of what we can do. Okay. I want to talk a little bit about how these are connected and then I want to get to some questions. So give us some idea. How do you connect all of these telescopes together? What's the so, process? So the, the other, the, the other technological miracle of this. The telescopes are, are one technological mirror, uh, uh, miracle. And the, the other technological mirror, miracle is the, uh, is the dig digital signal processing uh, that's a part of the digital revolution that we're all experiencing that uh, uh, powers our, our iPhones and the uh, computing in the cloud. Um, we collect we, we record at each station vast amounts of data. And uh, we're recording data at about a rate about a thousand times a fast home internet connection. So we're recording data wow. currently at a rate 64 gigabits per second. In the radio wow. frequencies. In the radio frequencies. And, uh, and we have these, we have giant banks of, uh, of disk drives. Uh, and we're writing that, those, that, that, that data directly to the, onto those disk drives. We have each, we, we, in each station, we have a bank of either four or eight uh, of these recorders. And each of those has a cartridge, which has eight, eight terabyte uh, hard drives uh, in mm -hmm. that cartridge. And when we're done with our five-day experiment, we have filled up all of those disks. So we're in, recording. In five, day. in five, five days. Five days. Five, day, five days worth of data will completely fill up all your storage. Exactly. Exactly. Wow. So we collect hundreds of terabytes of data per station. Mm -hmm. uh, and then we use the most efficient uh, uh, data transfer method known to man. Uh, Federal Express. <laughs> <laughs> I thought you were going to say UPS. Okay, Federal Express. <laughs> uh, I was going to ask. There's that. That was going to be my next question, and and you've already answered it. I, I imagine this is just a. Just, there's just too much data. You're just not going to be able to send it through uh, the interwebs. Uh, yeah, even times. gigabit speeds aren't going to get it to you in any kind of yeah. time timely fashion, is it? Exactly. Exactly. And uh, yeah, so we're. That's why we have this, this great technology of recording directly onto the disks and then sending it in. Um, you know, some of our sites are incredibly remote, right? So we're, we're observing from the South Pole, we're observing from Greenland. We have to, when we observe from the South Pole, we have to wait until winter is over in the South Pole and just to be able to ship the disk drives out hmm. uh, because, uh, there's no way to get out of the South Pole uh, in uh, in the middle of the Antarctic winter. May I may I ask? Um, you said that it was uh, five days was enough. Was all you know that would fill up your storage. So is that pretty much how the observations went down? You basically everybody took five days worth of data, and now you're just trying to combine it all. Uh, yeah, that's exactly right. So. We, we work, we do annual campaigns, usually in the spring, March or April, and we set up about 10, a 10 day window in which we'll take five days worth of data. And for all of that to work, all the telescopes have to be working. Uh, they, we have to be coordinated to uh, nanosecond uh, uh, 
time scales within with between those telescopes, and we have to have excellent weather at all of these globally uh, different stations uh, around the world. And when all of those conditions are right, we say go, uh, and mm -hmm. everyone works in lockstep, uh, observes for 12 hours throughout the night, and uh, uh, and then the long process of analyzing that data begins wow. uh, when the experiment is done. Okay, so, I didn't realize you had to take simultaneous data. I thought maybe, you know, some observations could be made on different different nights, but no, it all has to be done in one go. Uh, that's right. So we, for, for the interferometry to work, um, we have to, what we're doing is we're, uh, you can think of interferometry as a time delay experiment that we're catching the same electric field, ele electric vector, electromagnetic wave at one telescope and at another telescope. And, uh, and then we, we measure just, we, and we know that they're going to arrive at different times because the telescopes are at different positions. Uh, and we know roughly where we're looking, uh, but slight delays in, uh, in the arrival time between the two stations gives us really precise information about just where the light is coming from. Hmm. And then by having all these different pairs of antennas, each one measuring a different time delay, we're able to reconstruct an image out of, uh, out of that information. So can I show your interferometry uh, diagram? Does that? Uh, yeah, absolutely. Yeah, that'll, that sort of shows what you're talking about a little bit, right? Uh, yeah, right. So... So this diagram, so we start on the, on the left with the theoretical image, the ring uh, that we want to image. And then we have this, our network of, uh, of telescopes. And every time we add one new antenna to our network, uh, we increase the power of the network uh, by N antennas because it's pairs of antennas that, uh, that, that matter. When you just have two antennas, you get one pair. When you have three antennas, you get three pairs. When you have four antennas, you get six. And it keeps on going up like that. Now, so the, the plot in the middle is uh, uh, where it says measurements. That's, uh, that's where, that's the part of the mirror that we're filling in. Uh, and the, each trace that you see, there are elliptical traces or parts, parts of ellipses. Uh, each one of those traces is a, is a pair of antennas and we're watching the same source as the earth rotates. And, uh, and it, we get a slight, we get different angle uh, on the source as the earth rotates and that's what causes those traces. So we put together all of that information. We make measurements of those time delays uh, at each point uh, along each of those tracks. And then we use uh, some really sophisticated mathematics uh, and image reconstruction uh, uh, approaches and turn those measurements into a an image. And so you see on the right uh, a, a, a realistic looking image of, of what we might get uh, from an actual experiment. Wow, that is how, so how cool. That... Look at that. <laughs> I love that. I mean, it's just amazing. <laughs> yeah. And and I just wanted to ask, just to clarify, because earlier we looked at some simulations, uh, but I think what we're seeing here, the reconstruction on the right-hand side of this image, that's that's kind of what we're looking to... Is that this is closer to what you're expecting to see? Yeah, that's right. That's right. Cool. So the the uh, the image on the left here and, uh, and the movie that we showed earlier uh, are a theorist vision of, of what's happening there. Uh, mm -hmm. and, uh, and then the image on the right is the uh, experimenters uh, vision of, of what we think we can achieve with the current technology wow. uh, and the current array. Um, oh, so yeah, yeah, it really that's, is actually, it's, uh, uh, you know, and uh, let me, let me say we've been, uh, you know, we've been, studying the black hole in the center of our galaxy, Sagittarius A star for, well, we, the astronomy community for, uh, for over 40 years. And uh, up to now, all we've seen is just a fuzzy blob. Uh, 
Mm -hmm. uh, and uh, we measured its properties very precisely, but it's just a fuzzy blob. And the dream of, of getting to, uh, uh, to make this kind of image of it is, is really uh, uh, thrilling, uh, really transformational in terms of how we see what we're doing. Yeah, yeah I, 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 I agree. I mean, I'm looking at this and I'm just, I'm getting chills just thinking, wow, what if it really does look like this? I, I can also imagine people, you know, who wouldn't have any context around this might think, well, how come it doesn't look like the thing in Interstellar? <laughs> and, uh, you know, I think I know what I would say to that, but what would you say to that? Uh, you know, well, it doesn't have that glowy thing that we saw in Interstellar. What's going on? <laughs> um, well, let me first off then say that what what they produced for Interstellar is terrific. And it's, you know, it's actually based on real simulations of uh, 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 that incorporates lots of the, the physics that's that's going on there. And, you know, supervised by the great Kip Thorne, who's, uh, you know, one of our one of the leading uh, uh, theorists of general relativity of, uh, you know, of the past century. Um, we're, what we're seeing is, uh, is different. Uh, it's, you know, it's been, there's, there's the filter of the actual observation, right? And that, you know, this is the, the unfortunate reality of not having infinite resources is that uh, we don't get infinite resolution. We don't get to see all the little details. But, uh, but many of the things that you see in that, in that interstellar image where it's, it's sort of half of an arc and, and then an arc that kind of cuts across it, a crescent shape with an arc that cuts across. Some of the models predict that we will see that. And if you, you know, if you think about the movie that we showed uh, uh, earlier, right, that did have that, that arc that, that bisected uh, the, uh, the ring. Uh, and, uh, there, there are some details like that that are dependent on just, just the details of how the, the particles are arranged and the light is emitted, you know, just where it's coming from around the, around the black hole. The ring is a really, the ring is a feature where, where sure is, uh, should be there. Um, but there are other features that will defend, depend on the, the messy astrophysics of, of what's happening very closely. Mm -hmm. So when you said earlier that we were able to detect the best we were able to do in the past was to get a fuzzy blob when mm -hmm. in studying Sag J star, uh, that, um, was that what wavelength, because I know Chandra has done a lot of, uh, images of the Chandra X-ray Space Telescope mm -hmm. has done a lot of views of of the center of the galaxy, but what were the other wavelengths in which it was a blob? Well, so at radio wavelengths, so Sagittarius A star was discovered uh, at radio wavelengths, at very long wavelengths. It was discovered at I think a wavelength of of twenty centimeters, so you know, wave about that big, mm -hmm. uh, about forty years ago, and people immediately said, "Oh, that's that's probably the." the black hole at the center of our galaxy. And so in the wavelength regime between 20 centimeters and one millimeter, as the technology has improved, we've been marching along and going to shorter and shorter wavelengths and making those, making higher and higher resolution images. And we actually see a remarkable thing that it's this consistent fuzzy blob. And it turns out that, that that's the result of, uh, scattering by uh, electrons that are along the line of sight that kind of blur out uh, the image. That's where I was hoping we'd go. So yes, <laughs> one of the things, the, the center of the galaxy is very difficult to see at certain wavelengths. Yeah. Visible wavelengths, we can't see at all. There's too much junk, gas, and dust, and stuff mm -hmm. in the way. Uh, but at certain wavelengths, we can become opaque. Uh, the very high energy wavelengths, they, they mm -hmm. tend to go right through, and the very low energy wavelengths, like what we're talking about here. So this is why, folks, we have to we we have to kind of box in right. where we can see this black that's, hole. That, that's that's exactly right. Uh, and uh, you know this this scattering phenomenon is. You know, it's uh, sometimes we feel a little bit like, you know, nature has conspired against us. That uh, here we have this beautiful black hole. It's close to us. 
Uh, and, uh, and yet there are these electrons that are along the line of sight. They're not really likely associated with, with the black hole itself or anything near the black hole. Uh, they're just along the line of sight. But as radio waves hit those uh, electrons, they, they get jumbled around uh, and, uh, and it blurs out the image. Uh, that effect uh, weakens dramatically as we go to shorter and shorter wavelengths. So that's mm -hmm. another reason why we've gone to the shortest wavelength possible to do this experiment for, in order to get the weakest uh, amount of scattering uh, uh, interfe interfering with our, our observations. Okay, so uh, all of you radio astronomers have come together from around the world. You conjoled and you talked and you begged everybody, let's get a, let's be a part of this observation. Join in, point your telescopes and, and coordinate with us. And you've managed to, uh, over the course of the days that you've uh, made your exposure, you've taken your data. So where are we now? You're, I think, as I understand it, your data are taken, correct? Yes. And now what are you doing? Okay, so... Because we want to see uh, this thing. <laughs> <laughs> no one no one wants to show it to you more than I do. Uh, <laughs> um, Where's my black hole? I mean, it's springtime in the Antarctica now, so you should have yeah. the data. On, I mean, man. there's yeah. no more excuses. <laughs> Don't just stitch them together in Photoshop. Come on, man. Yeah. So we're we're actually we've had two campaigns now with uh, with Alma. Uh, so spring of 2017, spring of 2018. Um, and, uh, we have a, we have a, in addition to having a global spring array, at Alma or spring up here, uh, uh North American spring, okay, North spring. American spring. So, okay. April, April, 2017, April, 2018. Got it. Uh, Alma uh, autumn, basically. Yes. Yeah. Uh, hmm. and, uh, and so we have. So it takes, because of getting data from all the sites and all of that, it takes about six months after the experiment before we've actually really assembled all of the data together. And then we have, in addition to a global uh, array of telescopes, we have a global collaboration of about 200 people uh, who are working away very, very hard on analyzing this data. So a very special uh, computer that we call a correlator that uh, that combines together uh, the uh, the data from each of the telescopes in each of these baseline pairs. Uh, we actually have two of those. We have one in Germany and one at MIT that process the data independently. Uh, and uh, and then we have a huge task of uh, of, of carrying out this. Uh, uh, sophisticated algorithmic inversion uh, of the data that goes from the incomplete mirror uh, to an image. So we are pushing very, very hard on that stage of it right now. Uh, and uh, I can tell you we have some really great results. I cannot <laughs> tell you what they are. <laughs> you, so you've got some tantalizing views. Uh, we have some really terrific results, uh, and I, you know, I will I will become a, an ex member of the collaboration if I tell you what they are. I know we don't you want know, to get you in trouble. It, it, but but actually, uh, Jeff, we can we can help you because uh -huh. um, you're you you know you may need some way of announcing this to the world, <laughs> and and I I think I can speak for Tony when I say that you know you are welcome to announce it to the world on on this show we, we would love to have okay. you back let's do that that would be awesome what would that i be? mean uh, i know yeah. that our audience sure. would appreciate hearing it and uh -huh. you know <laughs> just Absolutely. keep that in I'll mind i would love, to, hey, I'd love, love to i'd love to come back um uh, but you know, I, could, Jeff, I can tell you that we're you know uh anticipate something soon uh is what i will tell you okay uh, okay okay well i was going to ask like you know, uh, first quarter, second quarter, pro you know, but soon yeah, uh, we'll, yeah. we'll just take that. Yeah. We'll take that with the, uh, with the optimism. Um, <laughs> just, uh, we, we do have a number of questions, uh, in both of our chat rooms, Tony, sure. I thought maybe we could, we could start. Let's do it. Yep. I just wanted to get to the status of where they were and now we're ready. So let's start asking questions. Go ahead. 
Well, okay, I'll, I'll go ahead and start with a question, uh, a couple of questions, and well, one question of mine. We'll do one from yours, Tony. Um, so I think uh, Ask Questions, Try Stuff was asking, uh, could it be possible to do a similar experiment uh, or maybe the very same thing with a series of smaller radio dishes spread over, you know, filling in a lot of those gaps between the observatories that we have? I'm really paraphrasing the question. Uh, but do you want to go ahead and speak to that? No, is that, oh, is yeah. that possible or is that practical? Um, absolutely. Uh, you know, we're, and we're very interested in, uh, in expanding our array, in, uh, in filling in the gaps uh, in our mirror. And because we have ALMA, which is so much more sensitive than all the other stations, and the sensitivity on a, on a pair, uh, of, on a baseline pair, depends on the sensitivity of both telescopes together. So we, we are actually quite interested in putting telescopes in other locations around the world. We're interested in putting telescopes in space uh, that uh, uh, we can connect to from the ground or that even are working space to space. Uh, so more than one telescope in space that are, that are connected with each other. Hmm. The, uh, sure the have weather problem that way. <laughs> yeah, exactly. Exactly. Yeah. So you get out of the atmosphere, you, you know, always, you can always observe and you would continuously observe uh, if you did that. Um, a real challenge uh, is, uh, well, there are two challenges. Uh, uh, one, of course, is money. Uh, and then the, uh, the other is finding good weather locations around the world. Um, mm -hmm. you know, one of my colleagues is, uh, in Europe is working very hard to find a, uh, a location in Africa uh, that will be uh, a good location for a telescope. And there's a location in, in, uh, in Namibia that looks like it's good. It's not as great as... Hawaii or Chile or the South Pole, but, uh, but it's a good site. Uh, and so we're looking for sites like that. Okay. Well, guys, as, as most of you have noticed, I have the ability now to uh, look at chats from all of the different platforms we're streaming on, which is YouTube, Facebook, Twitter, and Twitch. And I'm looking at all of those now. I can I've, I put a real crude scroll bar here. I'll make that better for next time because I only just now started playing with it. But I, uh, I'm i looking at all of the I, – I can finally get it all into one spot, which is nice. Condor Boss on YouTube is asking, I've heard they already have an image, but they haven't verified and checked yet. When is the image due out? We just answered that. It'll probably be hopefully in the next quarter or so. Uh, and, ha and, and Simon Farmer wants to know if you've seen it. And you said that you've seen parts of it, right? Uh, yeah. I, so let me say we had a collaboration meeting uh, in the Netherlands uh, in uh, early November. Uh, and uh, it was one of the most intense weeks uh, of my life uh, that we had couple 120 scientists and engineers uh, students uh, uh, working very hard uh, on this uh, on this data uh, and uh, asking a lot of tough questions uh, you know we are we're making sure that uh, we make no mistakes uh, uh, with uh, with what we release to the public and what we release to our scientific colleagues. Well, yeah, but I, I mean, I appreciate that. And it's, I mean, that was something that when you think of things like gravitational waves and LIGO, they had to be super careful about because they had a very low signal to noise. What is your signal to noise here in this technique? Is it something, is it, is it a high, do you have a lot of signal and not so much noise? It's just a matter of getting it all, uh, you know, synchronized. I mean, what are the, what's the signal to noise like? So the signal to noise is it's it's difficult to define because we we have different levels of it or we we have to define it carefully when we talk about that. So instantaneously on one of these baseline pairs, say especially a baseline to Alma, the signal to noise uh, de, uh, of a detection within minutes is a uh, hundred. You know, so it's very robust. We detect the source very clearly. That means the signal is a hundred times greater than the noise. Exactly. Right. Um, the the more complicated and and difficult step is is that is that sophisticated reconstruction that we do, where we have all of these different measurements, uh, and we need to turn that into an image. And we have our measurements from our incomplete mirror, 
Uh, and, uh, and that is the regime in which we're working to, uh, um, uh, to be absolutely certain that, that we know what we're doing and we're not making any mistakes. Uh, and it's harder to quantify exactly the, what the signal to noise is. Okay. Okay. Um, I, I think that dovetails into a, into a question that was asked uh, in my chat, uh, Tony, but I think it'd be good to go ahead, uh, ask it here. Say the name. Um, the question, the question is, uh, how real will the image be? And, and it sounds to me like Jeffrey, that that's exactly what you're trying to make sure that it is in fact a real image and not some, not, not yeah, an artifact. Exactly. Um, the image is real. I, you know, this is, uh, yeah. and it's as, it's as real as it's as real as anything that, that you would take, you know, you point your CCD at something that's a little bit more direct. Uh, mm -hmm. but, uh, but the, the image is quite real and what we're not going to be giving you, you know, a, uh, an artist's interpretation, uh, right. <laughs> we're going to give you a, an image that is a representation of the data. <laughs> a lot of people will be uh, happy about that. So many, so many <laughs> artist representations, people get tired of those. <laughs> so no, this will be real stuff, be an actual image of an actual black this hole event horizon. Thing. This is, Go ahead this and take Condor boss's question down there. Are there any radio telescopes in space? A radio telescope on, will a, a radio telescope on the moon help? Um, so there have there have been a few radio telescopes in space. There's one currently operating. Uh, it's called uh, Radio Astron. Uh, it's uh, uh, a uh, a Russian project, uh, and uh, it has uh, it goes out to uh, extremely. Uh, uh, it's on an elliptical orbit, and so it goes out to extremely long baselines from the Earth. Uh, I think three hundred thousand kilometers. Uh, and, uh, and so that actually, that produces very high resolution images. Um, it doesn't work at the wavelengths where, where, where we work at, it works at longer wavelengths. Uh, so we can't use it for our science, but, uh, we do have a vision of putting, uh, telescopes in space that, uh, that will work at, uh, at one millimeter wavelength or even shorter, uh, for our science. Cool. Uh, Telescopes on the moon, uh, probably not really needed for this experiment. We're, it probably just adds a complication to try to put it on the moon and be happy with it just floating out there. Yeah, radio telescopes don't really suffer much, do they, from being under the atmosphere of the Earth? Uh, well, so at very long, well, there, there's, there are three regimes. So the typical radio waves... Uh, you know, 20 centimeter radio wave basically doesn't see the atmosphere at all or sees it only a very little. One millimeter wavelength where we're working, we're very heavily affected by, uh, by water vapor in the atmosphere, which is why our telescopes are all in locations that are high and dry. So getting out of the atmosphere would definitely help us. And then the very long wavelength regime where waves are one meter in, in, in wavelength or longer, um, those are affected by the ionosphere. Um, and so getting out of the atmosphere uh, 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 would be a great help to them. And people have talked about doing that on them. Okay, here's, a, here's one from Simon Farmer. If Jeff could compare the target image to the Meerkat image produced this summer of Sag A-Star region, would, that would be awesome. Okay. Uh, should I show I, that? I actually put that meerkat image. You into, did. That's uh, why I asked that question. <laughs> yeah, yeah. Let me go ahead and put it up. <laughs> it's up. Asking. We happen to have a picture. So <laughs> I've got it up. So maybe explain what we're looking at. Okay. So so this is the really large scale uh, image of the center of our galaxy. And you know, if if you're not, if you haven't been following radio astronomy, this probably doesn't look anything like what you think the center of the galaxy looks like, uh, right? If you're used to optical images of the center of the galaxy, you're used to seeing stars and dust lanes. And what you see here is you see the plane of the galaxy that goes across the, the horizontally across the middle of the image. Uh, and that really saturated region in the center uh, is where Sagittarius A star uh, lives, uh, but it's uh, it's it's 
on a on a very very small scale here. The scale of this image is uh, is probably a million times larger than the scale of uh, uh, of our image. Now I love this image because it's got so much great stuff going on in it. It's supernova remnants and star forming regions and these really bizarre uh, filaments, which are some kind of magnetized uh, structures uh, in the center of the galaxy and the the white points that you can see are uh, are background galaxies that we're seeing through mm -hmm. the through the the center of the galaxy. Um, there are pulsars in this image. It's really I, this is I, I'm really blown away by this image. I'm glad that everyone's getting a chance to see it. Um, Gary Wack. Well, I, I'm sorry I can't pronounce your handle, dude. Because where can I find this image? Um, I'm going to make the there, there's going to be a Google Drive folder. By the way, are the images that you've shared with us can they be shared with others, Jeff? Yes. Okay. So I'm going to make that Google Drive link available to you in the in the in the um, uh, in the video description after this hangout yeah. i didn't do it because i didn't get a chance to, to, to that jeff and you can just download it from there but yeah. you can also can, get that image elsewhere too right jeff yeah absolutely uh so i can uh, uh steer people to event horizon telescope.org uh which has uh a lot of information about our project and simulations and images uh the meerkat image uh if you uh so Meerkat is a telescope in uh, in South Africa, a new radio telescope in South Africa. Uh, and so if you search for uh, for Meerkat uh, and radio astronomy, uh, you, you may get some cute pictures of uh, uh, of, of little mammals, uh, but uh, you'll also get uh, great astronomy pictures too. <laughs> okay. Galaxia wants to know if you can tell us what you've seen in the image. I cannot. <laughs> <laughs> she's she's after some scoop here. That's. <laughs> um, oh, well, go ahead. Do you have a question, Christian? Uh, no, no. I was okay. uh, just going to ask. Uh, well, someone's asking, will the picture have color? Uh, <laughs> but uh, you know, just trying to find any grasping at any straws, well, right? <laughs> well, let me. I, I can I can address that. So uh, so the you know what it's color color is right is is. Uh, is seeing things at different wavelengths. Uh, and uh, so we're seeing things in the color of one millimeter wavelength, mm. uh, if, if you like. That's a way to think about what we're doing. Um, the, some of the images that we will release will be released with a color map that, uh, but the, that color map will represent intensity uh, right. you know, how, you know, white hot and red cool, that, that sort of thing. But, uh, we're, we're not likely to, uh, 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 produce images that, that represent true color in any, in any sense. Oh, okay. true microwave color. I, I, this, <laughs> this question is why I love doing these hangouts. This would, got bread is on YouTube, uh, is asking based on the angular resolution figure from before, um, I get around 24.3 million kilometers per pixel. The diameter of Sag A star is around 22 and a half million kilometers. Does that mean the black hole only takes up around a pixel? Uh, that's about right. Uh, I cannot verify, uh, on the fly. Those, <laughs> These guys are uh, sharp. I love you guys. <laughs> they do the math. In the, in the, uh, can't work it out in your head, man. <laughs> <laughs> good, uh, but, good question. Uh, but that's, that is about right. That the black hole itself, uh, is, is about one pixel. Uh, and, uh, and so they, we expect to have something like 10 pixels across the, uh, the, uh, the image. Uh, and uh, 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 yeah, so it's you know we're it's it's not going to be like this uh, meerkat image where there are you know there, I don't there know all, all that stuff in this image. right. Uh, well, here's a good question yeah. from Simon Farmer. I'm curious about this too because I like GPUs. Would real time on site processing using GPUs extend the recording time? Uh. Because so radio data are, isn't radio. I'm sorry, and then I'll let you answer. There no, are, isn't ahead. radio data well suited for that kind of streaming uh, processing that GPUs do? So um, we are uh, 
we're as a radio, the radio astronomy community is, is really big into, into using GPUs. Uh, we're also really big into using uh, FPGAs, uh, field programmable gate arrays. So we actually, uh, which are kind of a one, one level of complexity higher than, than GPUs in terms of the difficulty of programming, but they're, they're more powerful and more energy efficient. Um, and so we do pre-processing uh, of the data there uh, at, with, at the telescope site with our FPGAs. But one of, the, one of the cool things about our experiment, but also one of the things that makes it really difficult, what we're, you know, I take you back to the mirror analogy that I gave you, right? And we're basically stopping light when it hits our mirror in Hawaii. And we're stopping light when it hits our mirror in Chile. And we're recording the electric field. We're recording all the information that we possibly can about that light. And then we put it on an airplane and we ship it to MIT or to Germany. Mm. And then we start the light again and play it back in our, in our computer there. And um, that's the regime where, uh, uh, where high powered computing like GPUs, GPUs uh, or large clusters or FPGAs uh, also comes into play in a big way. Okay. Um, I'm not sure if it's Jan or Jan Dryak, but uh, can this principle be used with optical telescopes, interferometry, he's asking, uh, combining I, pieces of mirror all around the world? Um, it is, uh, it can be done, uh, but it, there are, there are some technical limitations that, that make it very, very hard uh, to do. Uh, so there, and, and to my knowledge, it has ne never actually uh, been done. Okay. Um, and it's, it's, there, are, there, are a few, there are a few limitations that, that make it very, very hard to do and, and, and not very sensitive. Now, interferometry, of course, began in the optical famous Mickelson Morley uh, mm -hmm. experiments uh, in which uh, in which on a single telescope they they put a they put an aperture mask and they just let light through two different holes in that mask and combine the light together from them and use that to measure the diameters of stars. Uh, and that technique is used locally. So where you don't record the electric field but where you combine the light from multiple telescopes that are um, maybe within 10 meters of each other or 100 meters of each other, and you get better angular resolution. Okay, I want to ask uh, Ryan Korn Korniloff's question and Simon Farmer's question together. Uh, observation, so the observations from the Event Horizon Telescope, will it produce a single image and not an animation? And... Simon's question was, uh, what are the, are there future uses of this telescope? Um, I'm sorry, Hans Milling, question. Hans Milling, not Simon Farmer. That's a great question about, uh, uh about, uh, whether we get a single image or a, uh, 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 an animation where our, our goal ultimately is to be producing movies, uh, uh, of, of what happens in these sources. So Sagittarius A star, um, the, uh, the orbital period, uh, the, in, of the innermost orbital period is about 30 minutes and we observe it for six to eight hours at a time. Uh, and so we do think that in the future we'll be able to see gas rotating around the black hole or features appearing and disappearing. Wow. That's a, yeah, I know. It's super cool. Yeah. I mean, uh, sorry. <laughs> um, I'm just it takes, special. <laughs> it's going to take a little bit more um, algorithmic wizardry uh, mm -hmm. than what we have right now to, to release that. Uh, I, I also want to I want to mention uh, that we have we actually have two primary targets. We've talked we've been talking about Sagittarius A star the whole time. We, we're also targeting uh, M87. And nope. I, actually, maybe if you want to pull up that. Sure. Uh, I got it. It's up. Uh and so, uh, so this is a M87 is a galaxy in the Virgo cluster, 
Uh, and uh, its black hole is about a thousand times more massive uh, than, uh, than the black hole in our, our galactic center. Uh, and uh, so this is the optical image, space telescope image. Uh, the white glow is all stars. Uh, buried deep in there is the, uh, is, is the black hole in the center. And then you see a, a jet of particles uh, that's in the blue. Uh, that's uh, uh, being ejected uh, by the black hole out of the center of the galaxy. Um, M87, uh, we will also want to make movies, but it evolves much more slowly because it's more massive. Typical time scales are a thousand times slower. So days to years rather than, uh, uh, rather than tens of minutes to hours. Okay, and I know we're out of time. That's why I'm. I have to. I'm trying to yeah. rush through this. What about the future projects? Are there any? And uh, and 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 this is from Hans Milling about the any would the latest radio telescope in China have helped this? If it were online, um, uh, yeah. The the fast telescope in in China, uh, terrific, very sensitive uh, uh, new telescope, largest telescope in the world, uh, but it operates at a wavelength that's too long for us. So. Okay. Uh, uh, plans for the future, we're just getting started. Um, mm -hmm. We, uh, you know, we have we have so much that we want to see in these sources. We want to we want to make images. We want to make movies. We want to we want to increase the sensitivity uh, of of our array so that we can uh, we can look at other sources. Uh, we want to, uh, we want to see how these sources change over time. We want to push really hard and improve the quality of the images that we make and see if we can see effects that tell us about whether or not general relativity is true. Uh, so, uh, really stay tuned. There, there's, there's a lot to come. Great. Um, well, I was going to, I was going to say we, we are just about out of time here, actually a little bit past time. Um, we didn't even get a chance to talk about some of the science questions uh, that you're hoping to answer, but um, obviously testing general relativity is uh, high among them, right? Yeah, that's, that's the, that's the, the, the big enchilada here. Uh, mm. Relative is, it relatively doesn't need any more tests. We've tested, <laughs> it's, it passes, we, it's okay. It's all right. It's, just show it's me passing. the black hole. That's what I want to see. The fact yeah, that there is one at all as a test is, is, is yeah. a, is a uh, good conf confirmation of Einstein. So. Yeah. Yeah, absolutely. <laughs> uh, you know, I, uh, seeing the ring, uh, will, uh, and, and, and this is, uh, will be an incredible demonstration oh, yeah. of, uh, 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 of general relativity uh, and of the existence of, uh, of black holes. Uh, and, uh, you know, and also I think, you know, quite visceral, right? That there's a, as, as Tony said at the, at the outset, there's a lot of evidence already for the existence of black holes, but an image, you know, just like, you know, that the, 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 the astronauts, the moon landing astronauts, looking back at the Earth and taking a picture of the Earth from the moon. You know, everyone knew we lived on a globe with oceans and continents and clouds. Well, uh, most of us do. <laughs> well, right. <laughs> Some people are still not. Few more people today than, than back I mean, then. Okay. But yeah. <laughs> uh, right. But seeing the image is just uh, that, that show, you know, it's a, it's, it takes you a step beyond. Yeah. yeah. And no more inferring, right? We're going to see it directly. This is it. This is the black yeah. hole. No, no, no inferences. Well, all right. I'm going to have to cut it off there because we are, we've, we've yeah. moved up enough of your time, but here's what I recommend, Jeff, perhaps early next year, you might consider a revisit and we'll go into the science questions of the event horizon telescope and, sure. and maybe dive into sure. it. Yeah, a little bit more. Jeff, like I said, the offer still stands. We'd love to give you a platform to announce your results. Uh, you know, <laughs> okay. nice try Christian, but I think they're going to probably, <laughs> <he's>, <laughs> I think he's got some uh, channels in mind for that. The whole world's going to pick I'd be up. happy to come on and talk about we're, the, our results. You're a rock star. We're shamelessly, Jeff, we're shamelessly going for ratings over yeah, here. Yeah, what are you going to do? you got to try what you can. No, but uh, Jeff, thank you so much for uh, for joining us. Yeah, I mean, I, I, I got to tell you, I'm, I'm listening to this, and and uh, Jeff, I'm just glad that you described that moment of seeing the globe for the first time, especially we're coming up on the uh, uh, 50th anniversary of Apollo 8. Uh, wow, that's uh, that was that was such a uh, you know, a critical moment, I think, in humanity. And I think uh, 
I think this is going to have a, a similar impact. So I, I thought that was a perfect analogy, Jeff. Thank you. Great. Yeah. Thank you. Yeah. yeah well, a real pleasure to talk to both of you and to your audience. Uh, All right. Well, always fun to do. Yeah, definitely fun to have you here. So I, I want to thank you very much. My guest today was Jeff Bauer. He's one of the founding members of the Event Horizon Telescope, a an effort, a worldwide effort to try and actually, not to try, but to image our black hole at the center of our galaxy and M87 as well. And it, the results are expected soon, early next year. We will be, we'll definitely be following up, hopefully, with new stuff. I want to thank you all so much for uh, being with me on this new chat setup. Also, this is probably the last Telescope Talk Pro Hangout for uh, 2018. Uh, Christian and I will pick up again early next year uh, with the with the uh, schedule hopefully being filled out soon. So this will be the last one. I will be back on with Future in Space on Thursday with Harley. That will be the last one of those for 2018. Uh, and I think Carol and I might be back the following uh, Thursday with some a look back at 2018. So that's what's coming up uh, for telescope and talk and live hangouts here on Deep Astronomy. Thank you so much for to Jeff Bowers for taking time out to talk with us. Thank you, Christian, for helping me co-host. I appreciate this. And please go subscribe to his channel, if Launchpad Astronomy. If you haven't, the link is in the description box. So go check him out. He makes some nice videos. All right, guys. Thank you all so much nice. for watching. And as always, keep looking up. <laughs>